All right, so this video is gonna be on thiols and sulfides, and then we're gonna finish it off with some epoxide reactions, okay? So thiols, just a reminder, it's a sulfur, um, but it's just like an oxygen. Um, and so we got that OL ending, just like an alcohol, right? And then the sulfide, it's got the two R groups on the left and the right. Um, and it's kind of like an oxide, if you think of it like that, I guess. Um, but thiols are also known as mercaptans. They have a mercapto group. That would be the SH group. And um, again, it's, they're just like oxygen, right? So they are going to have similar naming, similar reactivity, but subtle differences. Okay, so um, for example, this one is ethane thiol instead of like ethanol. Um, they look the same. They have the same geometry. They're bent, tetrahedral bent, um, just like this ethanol here, tetrahedral bent as well. And that's just because, again, sulfur is right below oxygen. Uh, one of the major differences is the boiling point. It's 35 compared to 78. And that's because oxygen uh, or OH groups can hydrogen bond, while SH groups cannot by definition. Okay, so um, that is obviously a drastic difference in terms of boiling point, And that's just due to that hydrogen bonding or the, lack, the inability to do so. So for naming, we just have the ending in thiol. Okay, so uh, we also want to name the parent chain and then add the suffix thiol. Okay, so um, this, it's pretty straightforward. I, I, I mentioned before, like I don't really want to go over something that you can kind of read the rules to, but I'll just go quickly um, and it won't hurt any. But SH gets the lower prior number priority when you have like a ring numbering system. And so, um, we got these two compounds here and you honestly just go through it like you normally would. So number the carbon or count the car longest chain. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. That is a hexane. So I'll go ahead and write that down first. Um, and then we can number from right to left cause that's going to give the thiol the first position. That's where our first substituent is anyway. One, two, four would be our uh, substituents. And that's a one thiol, two methyl, a four ethyl. So now all we have to do is jam those together, but the ending is gonna be the thiol as opposed to um, anywhere like as a normal substituent, okay? It's just like the alcohols. Um, so we've got 4-ethyl, 2-methyl, hexane, dash 1-thiol, okay? And that's it. I told you, it's, we've done this before, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. The only thing you really need to know is how to add in that thiol. So that is eight carbons on this longest chain. That's an octane. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so that's a two, four, six substituents. So two thiol, four methyl, six methyl. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is jam all those together. I'll probably put that on the bottom, bottom, uh, just below the molecule. See if I can fit it all in there on this page right here. 4,6-dimethyl, remember, we put that prefix there, that's an octane 2-thiol, okay? Now, and that's pretty much it for, for naming thiols, it's pretty straightforward, uh, which is awesome, right? We always wanna make, make things easy for us. Um, but how do we make the thiols? So we probably already know this too, if we really sat and thought about it for a little bit. Um, it's the same as alcohol, so think about how you might make an alcohol. You do that, but substitute a sulfur. So you add that sulfide group right there, uh, SH, my, the, the minus charge, kind of like a hydroxide, right? This is a good nucleophile for sure. And so we can do some SN2 reactions with that. Very easy. Um, let's say we have this uh, iodoethane, and we throw in NaSH, which is, again is just like sodium hydroxide. Uh, and then we get that substitution for the, for the SH in there. And that's how you make sulfide, or I'm sorry, thiols, okay? So um, what you can do with these, so a little, a little reaction with it, is make disulfides, RSSR, not, uh, not Soviet Union, but RSSR. We've got two thiols, and we can, we, what we need in order to make a disulfide, which you probably know 
what that is from biology if you have a biology class. Um, but um, we need an oxidizing agent. And so bromine and iodine are really good oxidizing agents. And so what they do is they make a sulfur-sulfur bond, which is that disulfide bond. I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't like that geometry right there. Let me fix that for you right there. Um, bada bing, bada boom, we got two sulfur bound to each other and then that's a disulfide, okay? So these are actually, disulfide bonds occur in uh, within our body and our DNA and stuff. So um, the way we can break disulfide bonds is we made them with oxidizing agents, so you guessed it, folks. We're going to break them with reducing agents. And our reducing agent in this case is zinc and HCl. So anytime you have an elemental metal, like zinc, for example, it doesn't have an oxidation state or anything, elemental metal is going to give electrons. That makes it, by definition, a reducing agent because metals want to just, they don't want to be typically the elemental metal and so they're going to give off those electrons and I like to think of it like this where you give it an electron and then that's going to get mad and it's going to want to break up right and then it's going to want to swoop on some protons after that and that's what the HCl is for uh, you can either give it one or two it doesn't matter you guys don't need to really know the mechanism but um, it's important that we understand that the sources for oxidation as well as reduction okay so Bromine and iodine are great oxidizing agents. Super common too. Okay, so uh, sulfides. We've got RSR. These are like ethers, so like the ROR. And now, uh, just like when we named uh, ethers, we'll name the uh, sulfides in a similar manner. So this was dimethyl ether on the right. And... Um, what we're going to get on the left is the dimethyl sulfide, okay? I don't know if you guys know about dimethyl sulfide, but it's stanky. Now, skunks don't, they don't spew out dimethyl sulfide. They do spew out sulfur-containing compounds. Um, dimethyl sulfide is actually, like, the reason why, like, certain foods stink. So, um, like, I think it's cruciferous vegetables like cabbage or brussels sprouts or broccoli uh you've heard of broccoli farts right this is probably one of the culprits right here or when you're cooking it in general it's my little stank going on in the kitchen uh love me some brussels sprouts mix them up with bacon i don't eat meat anymore though so I'm soup's bummed about that i don't know maybe on a special day we'll see but um yeah those are skunks smell and onion smell that's the structure right there for you but moving on to naming so the IUPAC for the more complicated sulfides because we just gave you the simple sulfides um, we're gonna kind of use the alkyl thio okay so uh, although the one on the left is a simple compound I'm still gonna do it as an ex example of the more complicated method and so we'll use the longer chain as our parent and then that sulfur group with the two carbons on it will be the substituent. So it's gonna be, what we would do is put butane as the parent chain and then ethyl thio as the substituent. So very similar to just naming normal alkanes, right? So obviously this is a pretty straightforward uh, sulfide. So what we would, we could, more easily name it by just give calling it butyl ethyl sulfide. So um, where you basically have the butyl group, you have the ethyl group, and then you put in alphabetical order and finish it off with sulfide. But this more complicated ring structure right here is for sure, for sure more complicated and you can't do that method. So you're gonna put cyclopentane first and then you have your substituents, the methyl thio first and then the two methyl put them in order, in alphabetical order, and since methyl thio is one word, we should put that uh, after 2-methyl, um, and then put 1-methyl thio cyclopent, to zoom in right quick, cyclopentane. Okay, so there you go. There you have it for the naming of sulfides and more complicated structures of the sulfides pretty straightforward nomenclature is nomenclature so you just usually have to remember the rules from the original um alkanes and then
kind of change a few things along the way. Well, how do we make them? And how do we obtain them as a nucleophile, right? Um, well, we can just use a thiol, add a base in there, and deprotonate it. And then we've got our um, that S, S minus, and typically the base is going to be like sodium hydride, and we've seen this before, right? And we used it to make alk oxides. So again, sulfides, alk oxides, very similar, um, or sulfur con compounds and oxygen containing compounds are very similar in structure and human activity. Um, here's another example. We've got oxonium ion, right? What do you think this is called? A sulfonium ion. Come on, too similar, get creative. Or keep it, keep it, keep it the same because it makes it easier for us, right? Um, and so how might we make these? Well, it's pretty much as you, as you would expect, you can have us uh, sulfide attack a carbon with a leaving group and then boom you got yep, your sulfonium ion right there and um, this is pretty much how we make our um, our um, what is it called uh, our s adenosyl methionine um, that's something the biological reaction that we saw uh, in the past so and I think we're so far along with this these types this type of chemistry that this goes without saying, but I'll show you. We can make this use this sulfide um, to kind of use it as a nucleophile to attack a, a bromomethane, and there you go. You get your ethyl methyl sulfide, and that's how you make them, right? So you can use. Um, them as strong nucleophiles and then attack via SN2 and very straightforward, right? So um, I think, again, I think that goes without saying, but it's just want to show you real quick. Um, and so that's sulfur compounds. Now we want to move on to reactions of epoxides. These are a little bit more fun because um, I think it's, it's more complicated, I guess, and I find that fun, but also stereochemistry is a fun game. And so we get to um, do open these rings up because they are strain rings and they're very reactive. Uh, we get to open them up with nucleophiles. And um, when we have wedges and dashes, and that means we're having to think about the stereochemistry of the final product. Um, and so we are going to get backside attack, which pops this ring open as such. And um <clears throat> excuse me and if you have our groups indicated like our prime our double prime our triple prime then you can imagine that if we um attack from a certain way or consistently in a certain manner then stereochemistry of the products is going to be um more complicated right so we're gonna to have to think about this and but let's just go into the two types of reactions with the epoxide so we're gonna have the strong nucleophiles attacking and then we're also going to have acids with nucleophiles as well and so um these could be in the form of like hcl hbr hi or they could be like water and an acid but let's do the strong nucleophiles first so we might have like a hydroxide, alkoxide, oxide, um, the uh, sulfur compounds, we get the CN, cyanide, or NH3, just some strong nucleophiles, right? Um, and so if we have a strong nucleophile, um, and it's going to attack an epoxide, it does it in a specific manner, and it does it differently than the acids with the nucleophiles. So, um, Fortunately, it's as we might expect. So it's going to be occurring via an SN2 mechanism. And what does that mean for us? That means that we're going to have inversion of the stereochemistry um, about the carbon that it does attack, right? And so we're going to get that umbrella in the flipping inside out. Um, and then we have uh, the nucleophile attacking the least substituted carbon on the epoxide. And so... In this case, um, 
they are both the same because they both have they all both have only hydrogens but there's definitely a, there are definitely going to be cases where they could be different and we'll see some of those shortly but um and then i want to give you these two different perspectives as well where you have your epoxide um kind of in the plane of the board and then or like in typically in it drawn in a ring you'll have the epoxide coming out or going into the plane of the board okay so we can have a nucleophile attack either side on this particular ring compound because it's symmetrical and there's no least substituted side, they're equal. And so what we get is two different compounds, okay? So what we're going to get is the nucleophile attacks, pops that ring open, and we end up with a negative charge on that oxygen. It's kind of like as if it left as a hydroxide or an alkoxide group, okay? So the nucleophile on this guy, it's going to look a little bit different, but it's all the same. So, sorry, I forgot to push that arrow to give you the product on the right. And then if you attack on the other side, you get the blue arrow popping off that oxygen and you get the product on the left with the check mark. Okay, so let me do the same thing here. I'll do the blue check mark as the blue arrow. That's when you pop off on that side, you attack the right side of the compound you're gonna get the nucleophile on the bottom right and then the O minus on the upper left. So let's do the red one as well. Um, that's gonna just force that ring to pop open to the right side. So that puts the O minus on the upper right and then the nucleophile on the bottom left as seen here. Okay, so we're as you can see, I mean, in this case, we're getting two different products um, for each of these because and they're equal uh, because it's statistically going to be equally likely to do attack either one of those. But once you start getting more substituted um, epoxides, that's when you're going to favor the uh, attack of the least substituted carbon. OK, so for example, if we have eth oxide, this is clearly a strong nucleophile. Um, <clears throat> we have the first step is attack of that. And the second step oh, for water, that water is there because it's going to protonate the alkoxide that forms that we drew above, essentially. So um, if we look at these carbons, we've got a tertiary and a secondary. So we're going to attack the secondary that's going to pop open that ring. So the alkoxide goes to the top portion of this particular ring. Let me draw it down here because I want to draw the product on the, uh, immediately after that arrow. So we have that alkoxide. Notice the stereochemistry of that oxygen is the same, but the uh, introduction of the nucleophile to that carbon is a wedge instead of a dash. Uh, I'm sorry, as a dash instead of a wedge. And um, that's because we have inversion of stereochemistry, right? And so um, that backside attack resulted in the dash of that nucleophile being introduced. And then the water as a second step means that we're literally introducing it later after the reactions of the nucleophile is done. And then it just protonates the alkoxide to make alcohol. And you get our product on the top. So um, nothing too crazy, right? It just looks a little weird um, because it's an epoxide, but it is the same stuff that we've seen before. Um, hence why we're cruising through it. Um, what we have here is an acetylide ion, and then we also have water in our second step, of course. Um, this one in particular is the least substituted carbon, and so that's why we attack here. After protonation of that alkoxide, we get the alcohol on the upper left, and then our acetylide um, added on the carbon on the right, okay? Let me, I don't like that geometry or the way I drew that. So I'm gonna draw this bond for you and there you have it. So um, that's not too bad, right? It's pretty straightforward as expected, strong nucleophile. We're gonna attack in the general trend of uh, SN2 does attack, uh, which is more reactive at the primary carbon and it is the second than it is the tertiary. And so um, that's exactly what we saw. Now, of course, why not, why not do another example? And then we can talk about the stereochemistry of those products after. So 
Um, since we talked about dials and sulfides, let's use one to, or let's make one, right? So, um, and here we go. Remember that second step is the addition of water to protonate the alkyl oxide. We can attack on either side for this one. So that means we're going to get two products in equal amounts. And what's the relationship? What do you think? Let's check it out. So we've got, um, the dash again for the nucleophile that was added because, it is a backside attack and the wedge on the epoxide is going to remain the same so for that oxygen and so this is what we get here all right let me see if i can rotate this molecule you can see that these are mirror images of one another right so it's kind of weird flipping that thing over but i think you get the idea obviously the letters are upside down but bear with me right this is a mirror image yeah now Let's go ahead and I'm gonna copy this guy, put the thing down, flip it, reverse it, of course. But, so they're mirror images, but they are not superimposable. And once you start putting it in this direction where the substituents are on the right and you try to stack them, clearly that doesn't work. And so they're non-superimposable mirror images, AKA and antimers, okay? And that's the relationship of the epoxides that form um, in this particular case. And as a result of being able to attack from either side, right? So um, now let's do uh, reactions of epoxides with acids. Now this is a little bit different. Unfortunately, it's going to be like low key kind of counterintuitive. Um, and not following all the rules that we've gone over so far for substitution reactions, but we do have a decent explanation for you. So bear with me. We do have an acid, right? So anytime you have an acid, you want to protonate the strongest base in the in solution. And so in this case, it's the oxygen. And then we got a Z group, which is the count conjugate base of that acid in this case. And it's also going to be a nucleophile, right? So it's going to attack and Bada bing, bada boom, you get protonation, or protonation occurs first in this case, so um, you end up with the alcohol after nucleophilic attack, okay? So uh, once that nucleophile attacks, um, we do get our product, but it's the key thing in this one, and the reason why it's so weird is that it occurs at the more substituted carbon, even though it's SN2, and... Um, so we're still going to get inversion of stereochemistry, but it's going to be inversion at the more substituted carbon, okay? And that's that's the major difference between these two types of nucleophilic attack. And it's really useful because you get substitution at a different carbon, right? So um, it works out. And so typically the, the acids that you're going to use and that... Uh, the nucleophiles that go along with them are going to be HCl, HBr, HI... Or the uh, we could use water or an alcohol as well as some acid like sulfuric acid for example. Okay, so um, as you can imagine, the H's on the acids are going to be the source for the proton on the oxygen, and then the chloride, chloride, bromide, iodide, as well as the oxygen on the water or alcohol, are going to be the nucleophile in this case. Okay, so it's that general trend above where Z is substituting at the more substituted carbon um, and we get inversion of stereochemistry, but just substitute in chlorine, bromine, iodine, or OH or OR. And that's the reaction in a nutshell. But of course, we're gonna do a couple for you, okay? So we got an unsymmetrical epoxide with two methyls on the left. Uh, the sulfuric acid protonates the oxygen giving you that oxonium intermediate. Um, and then of course water was there as well. I didn't draw that, but water is this, our nucleophile and our nucleophile, um, after we've protonated that oxygen, we got that positive charge on that oxygen, right? And so um, that means that we're our nucleophile, our weak nucleophile is going to attack the more substituted carbon. Okay, so that's this one right here. Okay, and um, it's going to look like this. We're gonna get that popping open, and then we're going to get inversion about stereochemistry about that carbon. 
and um, it looks like this, right? We do have a proton on that oxygen that what from the water, and so that's just going to be removed by maybe the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. Um, but I mentioned before, I like water as our base uh, as well because it's better. Um, so, but some base is going to come along and remove that proton, and bada bing, bada boom, you got your your diol that two alcohol uh, containing compound, okay? And um, that's pretty much the ring opening process for this guy, right? Um, for an epoxide in the presence of an acid and some nucleophile, generally, like in, in this case, water, which is weak, but um, I wanna work my way back and just show you. All right, so here's the, the dimethyl uh, epoxide right here. If we used hydroxide, it would attack from the right side, right? Pop that open, throw a little water in there, you protonate, you get your alcohol, or you get your diol, right? Um, and it does look a little bit different, right? Technically, these two compounds on the left and the right, far left and far right, using the two different methods are the same. But if we had our groups on there, like our primed and our double primed, then the outcome would be different. And that's something I want to point out for you because like why use the two methods? Well, you're going to get two different substitution patterns and therefore two different products possibly, okay? So if we rotate this molecule right here uh, the in blue, if we rotate it to kind of make it look more like the bottom one on the left, then it will... Oh snap, I'm tripping. Why did I just draw the same exact thing pretty much? Um, just needs a nap. Okay, so uh, let's fix that for you. So we'll put the OH on the up. <laughs> and then the wedge and the dash, as you can see, we have this R prime and the R double primed are swapped for the, for the compound on the left, okay? So the one that I've drawn in blue is via the H2O and sulfuric acid method. And then the one on the bottom left is via the hydroxide method. And so you're going to get two different products in this case. And so that might not always be the case. Um, sometimes your, your choice in using uh, water and sulfuric acid, it could just be uh, to kind of save or protect the um, integrity of the molecule. And so you don't mess anything else up. And maybe some other functional groups might react with a stronger nucleophile or maybe they'll react with acid. And so that would be a reason to go the other route. But let's throw another one at you real quick. We've got HBr, we'll go ahead and protonate because we have an acid, right? All day, every day. Now we got this oxonium intermediate and this guy is a tertiary carbon on the upper part. And so we're going to like imagine that that left, right? Imagine that OH left. And that's where we can justify the bromide attacking the more substituted carbon. Because if it left, it would result in a carbocation intermediate, which would be more stable at the tertiary carbon than it would be at the secondary carbon, right? And so that's why we can kind of justify this. And that's going to be, if we're going to put the carbocation at that position, there is a transition state that will put a positive charge at that carbon. And so the more stable that uh, transition state, then the more likely we're going to go that route. Okay, so um, that's the reason, right? It's still an SN2 attack. We're going to get inversion, but the attack at the more substituted carbon occurs. And that's just really all about these transition state being more stable because of the more substituted carbon kind of bearing more of that positive charge or being able to bear more of that positive charge. Um, and then um, just to remind you again, just put it right nice and neat, just blow right in your face. Strong nucleophile attacks the least substituted carbon and then using acids, I, I tend to think of them as like weaker nucleophiles, uh, but I guess it just depends on the solvent, but um, using acids in any case is going to attack at the more substituted carbon, okay? 
and then again they're both s and two mechanisms and so we do get inversion even though we kind of think about we can kind of think about that oh kind of popping off and a uh, positive charge being at that tertiary carbon for example and then being more stable but um yeah, it's still S and two, and so we do always get that inversion product. Okay, so let me draw this uh, this guy right here for you. Let's think of it. We've got ethanol and sulfuric acid. Okay, so uh, we've got the same molecule, and then now uh, we've got we've got uh, a two step process here, right? So we're gonna have the first. We're gonna add our methoxide. Second, we're gonna add methanol. Okay, so this is kind of like what we saw above when we did our examples of the strong nucleophile attack, um, but we used water in, instead. And I'll show you why it's important to use methanol in this case. So um, on the top, we've got the acid, and then on the bottom, we got that strong nucleophile. But on the top, we want to, since we have the acid, we want to attack at the more substituted carbon. So we get the inversion, and I'm just gonna, I jump straight to the protonation process, uh, protonated product, sorry, and you get that product there, okay? But uh, let's say we do our strong nucleophile, we're attacking on the right side, the less substituted carbon, and then after protonation, we get this guy right here, right? But um, let me show you why we have methanol in there to protonate. So we, let's say we get this alkoxide, now that's going to attack the methanol solvent to get protonated, and that alkoxide becomes an alcohol. Okay, so what's the product, the byproduct of that, right? Well, we get methoxide from there. And remember, the methoxide was our source of nucleophile in this. And so we created another nucleophile to kind of move on and attack another epoxide. So this is going to help promote. Uh, formation of the product in this particular reaction. But if we used water like we did before, we would form hydroxide as a byproduct, and that would result in side reactions where the hydroxide, a strong nucleophile, attacks that epoxide, forming a diol instead of addition of that methoxy group. Okay, And so that's why it's important to use the methoxide as well as methanol together. And this is actually a really common thing where you'll see Anytime you're using like a methoxide or an alkoxide, you're likely going to see, or if you can, you're going to see the solvent being used in that reaction being essentially the conjugate acid of that alkoxide. Okay. Now that's it. Uh, have fun with it. Uh, there's a couple other things in this chapter, but they're more just kind of like biology related that are really just, uh, hey, here's some drugs, check them out. But So check them out because it is some fun stuff, but it's nothing that we really need to explain it or go into depth about. Okay, have fun.